Good afternoon and welcome to Follow the EPHI, Keys to Protecting Your Most Sensitive Data, a health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Talcite. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments anytime in the Q&A box, and we'll take them later in the program. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time, we're going to go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring James Case, VP and CISO at Baptist Health, Rich Temple, VP and CISO at Deborah Heart and Lung Center, and David Ting, CTO and co-founder of TauSite. And then we will get to our questions. So let's jump right in. Lots of good stuff to talk about. Uh, James, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Yes, uh, we're in Jacksonville, Florida. We have about six hospitals, 14,000 employees, um, 80 or 90 doctor's offices. So we've got plenty of PHI all across the health system that we're trying to track. I love it. Plenty of PHI. No shortage of PHI. No shortage of PHI. Yes, sir. <laughs> Rich? Hi, my name is Rich Temple. I also don't lack in the PHI department, <laughs> though we're a much smaller place. Um, I'm the Vice President, Chief Information Officer, and a HIPAA Security Officer at the Deborah Heart and Lung Center in the uh, wilds of Southern New Jersey. Uh, we are a cardiovascular specialty hospital, and we are an alliance partner of the Cleveland Clinic Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, so we do a lot of good work here. We're small but mighty is what we like to say. And one thing that's unique about us is that we're one of three hospital systems in the country that as a matter of policy, we don't balance bill our patients. So we provide excellent care, but we don't, um, we don't actually balance bill patients as part of our core mission. So it's, a, it's very gratifying to be in this kind of an environment. Nice. Very good, Rich. Uh, David. Good afternoon. Uh, David Ting. I'm the CTO founder of TauSite. Uh, most of you may know me when I was the founder CTO of uh, Improvada. And I started the company as a, it's a venture backed company, basically to help solve what I saw was a recurring problem in healthcare, the difficulty of securing PHI, even as we reinforce, harden and uh, fortify our perimeter, that PHI stuff just leaks out everywhere and it's everywhere. So uh, great to talk about this topic and looking forward to it. <clears throat> All right, very good. Let's jump right into it. And James, we're going to start with you. Um, there's a bunch right. here. You jump in where you want. Describe the current challenges around EPHI tracking. Why is it so difficult to find and track EPHI? Where are some of the different places it can live? And has this the number of locations increased in recent years and the security implications of the expansion? Yeah, this is one of the things that keeps myself and my boss, Aaron Meary, up at night, right? So EPHI is in a lot of places, and we have policies against, you know, not putting it on your on your work device or storing it locally on mobile devices or or laptops or anything. But, um, you know, so the struggle is how can we track that? How can we find that? You know, tracking it on servers and file servers is much more doable. So we're so we're fairly mature in that space. But when it comes to endpoints, that's really a gap, right? And I think that leads into this purpose for the conversation. Um, and so it's against policy, but with calcite, right, then we're able to find it. And uh, then we know what we didn't know before and we can go enforce that policy, speak to the end user to make sure that they delete that data because at the end of the day, it's risk, right? And if that device were to go lost or stolen, then our patient data could be at risk. And so that's our, it's our job to manage that, identify that and then remediate that. So James, you, you mentioned that you're using calcite. Um how do you think organizations are grappling with this when they don't have a tool like that? What, what are they cobbling together and, and how are they trying to manage the problem? I, I guess I'll give you what our, what our path was before Telsite, and that is we just make sure every device is encrypted. We're rabid about our compliance with device encryption because that's the only tool in the toolbox, right? Making sure that if it's if the device is lost or stolen, that it is encrypted, validated as encrypted, we can prove it was encrypted, right? And then making sure that we're educating our users on not storing the passwords, any, you know, not writing them down, not storing their passwords where the, it would be included with the laptop. Making sure that we're, you know, making our users aware uh, about not storing PHI locally, right? Trying to reduce that risk as well. 
So I think that's that's all we could do at the time. So that's probably what others are doing right now. And why is that sort of suboptimal, or why is that not okay? We're done. Great. We have we we encrypt everything and we're good. I don't. I mean, this may be an unpopular answer, but I'm just speaking transparently. You know, caregivers are resourceful, right? Mm. Right. They're taking their priorities, taking care of patients. They're going to do whatever they can to take care of the patients, and I respect that and partner with them and and uh, do everything I can to resolve those pain points. But at the end of the day. If, if, if a physician or a nurse is trying to care for a patient and they're getting creative on what they're doing with the data, even if it's against policy, we need ways to find if anybody's going against policy that's increasing risk, right? And so mm-hmm. that's really where that comes in. Okay, very good. Um, Rich, your thoughts? Well, what James said, and I, um, I, I, I can't concur more that there are so many opportunities for PHI to leak out through users and users' personal devices and other devices that we don't directly have uh, within our purview, you know, at the center and in our information systems department. But I also, you know, as I was contemplating uh, how, um, you know, how EPHI can float around a uh, float around a health system, I thought of other areas too that mm-hmm. that um, are niche niche systems within organizations. I thought of other processes such as. Um, submitting data to registries, um, patient financial services, communicating with payers, God forbid they send something in an email and it's unencrypted. I mean, we have, we have software that I am very confident encrypts the vast, vast majority of things that people forget, but I can't say with 100% certitude that it always, always works. So there are, there's a lot of processes behind the scenes where um, EPH, EPHI can leak out, you know, get re- registries, um, and people pulling things from tax systems, pulling information from medical devices, even all-in-one devices, scanners, printers, et cetera. There are so many places where they could live. And there are also cloud vendors now in the mix that we have to worry about what they're doing with their EEPHI and to what extent um, our cloud vendor business associates are using other business associates and that whole chain reaction. So, I mean, it just seems like EPHI is percolating in ways that it might not have a number of different years ago. And we jump through hoops to really keep a very, very tight rein on it, but there are just so many paths to, uh, down which it can travel that we have to keep an eye on each and every one of those to the extent we possibly can. Interesting. So David, it, if I'm understanding this correctly, it sounds like um, a, a strategy to just deal with the hardware and the devices is suboptimal, that that's not gonna, you really need to see the data and where it's moving and not just focus on the hardware and the endpoints um, because that will, there are workarounds for that and there are ways to the data to leak beyond that. Is that, is that correct? That, that is absolutely correct. I think, I think all the cybersecurity products out there are great at fortifying your physical, physical cyber making sure that you're, you know what's going on at the hardware or the, the network layer and where you're transiting or moving stuff to, but you don't have a visibility into where the data is, where, what the users are doing with it, what applications are, are touching the PHI. Um, if this were a bank, that would be your account information. In healthcare, it's your patient's information. And that is the basis by which modern healthcare uh, powers itself and, and improves its speed. Our, our goal is to move PHI to everywhere that you want that data to go to, but in a, in a manner that gives you visibility without teams and teams of people trying to build more and more uh, crafted tools to, to track that stuff. Um, challenges are, are hard. I mean, everybody will tell you that they know where their structured PHI is, but it's all the unstructured stuff. Uh, if you didn't have that unstructured stuff, your storage would be fairly well contained. But everybody I talked to says, yeah, we just bought another file server or we're moving more data to the cloud. And yet we don't know what all that stuff looks like. I mean, I this is a recurring theme as we go down this, this path of um, discovering what people are doing with PHI and how they're securing it, which, which has been an interesting journey. So, David, this is obviously, uh, you mentioned we started in Pravada to solve a problem. Um, you started TauSite to solve a problem. Um, th- can you give us a little bit of background on your journey from realizing this was a problem to be solved to to sort of coming out with a, a, a marketable software product? And and what did it take to get from A to B? Um, a number of, of years and, and a lot of work? 
it's not a trivial problem. So I, I sat on the HHS cybersecurity task force for 2017, and we got briefed by all the government agencies. This is following the year when 120 million rec uh, patient records leaked out of an organization, uh, out of multiple organizations. And you have to ask yourself, how does that much data flow out without anybody really knowing about it when they're flowing this stuff out? If this were paper records, I think I calculated uh, it's uh, four ounces per pa patient jacket, four records per pound. You know, 500 breach, the 500 record breach records, about 125 pounds of records. That's pretty much how you could walk, how much you can carry and walk out in a couple boxes of, of paper. A million records is a lot of paper, a oh, hundred millions, even more. So as we did, we've improved the velocity for a lot of transactions, but it's also increased the velocity of loss. And you could steal a hundred million records without anybody knowing it. And the reason for that is because nobody's watching it. We know our traffic, we know where things go. We just don't know what go necessarily, where the PHI is, what's happening to it. So all the conventional mechanisms, people will say, oh yeah, I can, I can write some template, I can write some filters, I can write some rules, I can look at files. We wanted to make it drop dead simple so you could literally put the system on, leverage advanced AI and find those PHI in the unstructured content, open the document, extract out the text, extract out an image, parse it, classify it, but not require anybody to go and say, geez, I think that might look like PHI or that looks like PII. So we've leveraged a lot of AI to do this and it's not been an easy journey as you can imagine. Um, it's, but we have some great VCs that have backed us. Um, and so we're at the point where we're in the market and um, it's, it's been an interesting journey. People have different perspectives around how, how well or how they protect their PHI. Uh, and a lot of them will say I have policies and, but yet I don't know if the policies are actually being followed or whether I can have um, uh, an indicator of whether there's compliance to those policies. Uh, James, um, tell me a little bit about your uh, journey from the way you were handling things, you know, the, to the best of your ability, focusing mm -hmm. on those hardware and the endpoints and all that. Um, and was it that you became aware there was a product out there could help first, or did you say, I need something to fix this? I want something better. I'm going to go see if there's anything out there. What, what was what happened first there? Yeah, that's a good question. No, it was a challenge. We were just heads down focused on kind of a legacy approach, right? The, the uh, laser focus on the encryption of devices, making sure they're encrypted, that we're compliant with our policies on that encryption. But yeah, and then really it was more of an introduction to TauSite, right? Uh, and then that kind of opened my eyes and, and uh, shed light on how it could solve kind of that gap and so that's what we're excited about right now. We now we know what we didn't know earlier, and we're able to chase that down and lower that risk further. Very good. All right, Rich. Let's start with you. What are you currently doing to keep better track of EPHI? Um, you know, are you cobbling things together, doing the best you can? We are cobbling things together, doing the best we can. I mean, we. You know, we have we have some mapping of um, EPHI. That was always something that was considered to be a best practice. And you know, a few years ago, it was like, well, we we kind of know. So, you know, we don't. I don't. I think we're. I think we're okay about that. But you know, with with the explosion of the cloud, with the explosion of use cases that take PHI beyond the walls of the center and to places that we might not have been sending a few years ago, it becomes trickier. And so, yes. Our interface engine provides us a very detailed map of PA of um, you know where PHI is flowing inbound and outbound. But you know, like I mentioned earlier too, there are a lot of use cases within departments where PHI can flow out, and we have to make sure that we're staying on top of that and inventorying that and just understanding that to make sure that whoever the recipients are of the PHI that we're sending outbound that they have the same kind of safeguards at their SOC two or whatever it may be. And we can and we can feel comfortable that it's going the right place. We also have to make sure that everything is, if it's being FTP, that's being SFTP'd. 
Uh, we, we just we, there's so much to consider. We it's very tempting sometimes for um, when you're when you know out of necessity we're sharing information with um, organizations we're collaborating with or registries or whatnot. So easy to say, I'm just going to, you know, sh uh, you know, pop something onto a website and it's there, but you can't do that. You have to make sure that everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. You have to make sure you've got a BAA. So there, there are many, many things you have to think you have to think of, and the number of people who are interacting with us in the outside world who are going to be legitimate recipients of our BH EPHI has grown exponentially. So staying on top of that, building building those process maps, building those flows that show what's going from point A to point B why it's going there, how it's going there, really becomes critical to succeeding in this regard, I think. And Rich, you know, we talked about uh, one of the challenges is uh, employee workarounds, clinician workarounds, trying to, you know, do their job with good intention, uh, doing things that may be outside of the scope of what the organization would like to see. So how do you handle that from an employee education and sort of creating a culture of cyber awareness that, hey, we understand there may be temptations here, Tell us what you're trying to do and, and we'll give you the best advice, but there's certain things we really don't want you doing. Well, we, we, have, on, we have ongoing mandated computer-based learning that um, everyone has to take. We talk about it um, at, at folks or at folks' hospital-wide orientations. We talk about it at departmental, departmental onboarding. When we do our fake fish campaigns, we talk about what the consequences are of uh, clicking on something that could cause ransomware, and that's a whole different path that we can go down. But I try to couple couple that type of education with the fact that anything that runs the risk of exposing EPHI is something that could be potentially devastating to us. So I think we um, we really have a good soapbox where we are we're monitoring what people are doing. We're educating people on um, what they should or should not do. Um, we're also uh, educating people that you can't just um, put something on Dropbox if you need to send it out because I mean that's that, that certainly is easy. It's just not right unless unless you unless it's HIPAA unless it's HIPAA compliant. You've got a BAA. It's secured end to end. All those things that users who are just trying to get data from point A to point B to uh, be compliant, they don't necessarily think about. So we have to have education at every turn. We have to have monitoring at every turn. At every turn, we have to block sites, mm. except um, on a rare case by case basis. We have to generally block sites that could be insecure and tempting for people to use to transport PHI. So yep. it's never ending, but, and you really have to have a multi-tentacled approach of education, blocking, um, a little bit of carrot and stick with a little more emphasis on the stick sometimes, um, but you have to have all of those things in concert to really have an effective plan. Very Rick, good. Go ahead. Hey, can I add on top of that? So I would add also partnering with privacy audit risk compliance, right? So it's not just IT, right? It's about that partnership and those relationships that it's, and it's part of the over the larger data loss prevention, right? That's really where TalSite plugs in for me, um, but it's about that partnership and that way you know, the messaging is not just an IT message, but it's 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 a business message because at the end of the day, it's a business risk. James, uh, with with TalSite tool, is that actually going to prevent data from moving to play? And, and David, you can weigh in on this as well, obviously. But is that going to prevent data from moving, or is this going to let you know where it moved so that you can then address it? Right. Yeah. To me, I, I'm taking a phased approach, right? And I think David touched on the later phases, but to me, the phased approach is knowing where PHI is that I didn't know before is kind of the first phase that we're finding now, right? Seeing where somebody's non-compliant so we can help them get into compliance and remove that PHI to lower that risk. But then the next phase, exactly as, as you just said, Anthony, it's about tracking the movement of it, knowing where it's moving and learning from that as well. And then at that time, it really, as we learn from that, then we'll kind of pivot and to see if our policies need adjusting, see if our, if our education needs adjusting, you know, and, and our controls maybe. David, yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I'm complete agreement. I, I think the last thing we want to do is to be a blocker for clinical workflows, not recognizing the importance of what a doctor um, decided at that point they needed to do. Uh, is is not is not something that we can ever build into our logic or in our into our tool. I think the first step is really giving good visibility to where all the all the data resides, how it's being used, um, who's using it, and then where is it going. And then each of those steps will have different 
policies that you can apply to and, and decide, gee, do I, did I cover all the use cases that, that my users are, are um, um, taking advantage of uh, in terms of using the data and, and are those policies being followed and what are the exceptions and how do I augment my policies or, or controls so that you can start to rein in on, on these behaviors. Uh, the safest system is used to be, you know, you have really well-trained users and I would love to believe that all users are, are well-trained. We've done, we dealt with government agencies, financial, healthcare, guess what? In almost any of those regulated industries, you will still get rogue users that for some reason will not follow the rules. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna be any different, but we can't exclude them because they're such a critical part of that workflow. Um, for certainly for treating patients. So the best thing to do, do is to know what they're doing and figure out where the exceptions and really have traceability to, gee, you know, exactly here's what you did. You were on that machine. You took this content, you, you've moved it out on some device. And, and the, the biggest device that you can take out today is, is your laptop that's not encrypted you know, with a lot of PHI. Uh, we see we've seen tons of those stories of people walking, losing, losing their laptops, and you go, "Oh my God, what was on that thing?" Uh, I think the worst story was somebody returned, a uh, law enforcement returned a stolen laptop, and it goes, "Hey, we gave you your laptop back," and the and the response was, "Now you just gave me a huge headache. Mm. Now I have to count for all the data that was on it and report it." So with the double, it was a double-edged sword. And sometimes these seemingly small infractions can mushroom into large oh. systemic issues. And I, by way of example, I mean, I've had to really hit people over the head is that, you know, you can't have referring doctors texting information through SMS text into physicians here, into our uh, transfer center here. We can't text things outbound. Uh, you have to use secure texting. I know it's easier. It's one more app that they have to use. They're very used to doing traditional texting. Um, it's one at a time, but when you don't enforce it, it's kind of like a broken windows theory. If you don't enforce that and just repeatedly right. tell people they can't do that, it becomes a culture unto itself. And you do run the risk of large scale leaks and you run the risk of um, people being cavalier about sharing that kind of sensitive information. So yeah. even those little things can wind up being big things if you're not keeping a very, very watchful eye on it and tamping that down at, you know, right, right at the outset. That's a good point. <clears throat> James, uh, talk to me a little bit about the relationship between uh, someone like yourself as a CISO and the policies that we want to adhere to, right? So we're talking about being in line with the organization's policies, but those policies, I assume, are living documents that evolve over time and have to reflect the current state of technology, the current state of policy and regulation. <laughs> Um, to what degree do you have to be plugged into making sure the policies stay in line with what's going on at the organization, what's going on and what's required? And that's where we talked about having good relationships with compliance and privacy. I would imagine there may be interactions there at which point someone brings up, hey, we need to change our policy. And then we can worry about tweaking maybe the Tau side app to make sure that the movements of data are in line with the new policy. Yeah. Great question. I would say that, you know, as the CISO, I, I'm the owner of those policies, right? So I certainly helped develop them. We, we rolled out NIST CSF, so our, our policies are built around NIST 853 language, and so that's what's in there. <clears throat> but to your point, Anthony, I didn't do it in a vacuum, right? I did it with legal, with compliance, with audit and privacy uh, at the table so we could navigate that together and work through those controls and really talk about the risks kind of category by category or policy by policy or framework by framework. And so um, that's how we kind of manage through that. So again, it's not just an IT decision. It's a, it's a business decision with input from IT and me helping to lead the risk-based conversation. And it's never done, right? I mean, that's something nope. that should be revisited uh, periodically, but regularly, right. correct? Yep. Yeah, so NIST CSF, so we're fully rolled out now. And now again, using that as a policy example. And so now we're Kind of rinsing and repeating you and going back through and, and, and really improving our, our whole maturity, finding those controls that we want to focus on next that will lower the risk the most, <coughs> and then improve our maturity, which is adding more to our policies, right? You know, tightening up a little bit and uh, 
making them more comprehensive. Yeah. And then making adjustments to the Tau side app to to the controls, to the to technology, the to education, to yeah. awareness, to yeah, everything. Right. To the tools and, and the education. Rich, your thoughts around that, around um, your involvement with the policies and policies changing over time? I am, I'm heavily involved in those. And like James, I work very closely with uh, my my privacy officer, uh, the world of compliance, uh, our legal people. Um, you know, I'm, I don't have a CISO myself. I, I kind of act, I, I kind of am in that role. So I um, you know, I, I, I own those policies, but I own them with a lot of input from other people. And I have to, because it's one thing for the information systems department to say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but you have to have universal buy-in and you have to have universal understanding. And you need to be able to extend outward to make sure that people know the policies, people know why these policies exist, and people know that we have to have the wherewithal to monitor compliance with those policies. And that's not something that one department can or should do. It needs to be an, inter an interdepartmental approach. No, Very good. David, uh, anything you want to tell us about making adjustments in something like Tau site to reflect changes in policy? So I look at policies and controls as, as, as part of a control system. As an engineer, I always look at what's the closed loop, what's the feedback loop, what data do I need to supply in order to make the adjustments so that you can get compliance of the policies, you know, where, where you see deviations, things like how much, how much stale data should a, how much stale EPHI should an owner have? Is it 500 files? Is it 5,000 files? Is there, is there a retention period for the stale PHI that you have on your, by, by users on file shares? Um, what about access policies? All these things, we've seen them vary all over the place across different hospitals that we've worked with. Everyone ultimately comes back to, well, let's go back and see what our policies look like and maybe make adjustments. Should there be a policy on retention periods? Should there be a, a six month retention on data that's alive? What we found, for example, is that PHI data that sits on a server, the date of creation and the date of last access for, for really old data tends to be around three months, which basically means after three months, nobody got, went back and actually touched it or looked at it. It's just sitting on the server, waiting to be compromised or or, or you're just backing it up, up over and over and, and keeping it alive. Those are places where policy adjustments can be made that have not only to lower your liability in a, in a, in a data extortion, blackmail kind of uh, ransomware attack, it also reduces your liability for all kinds of other things like uh, the, the laptop, that you say, gee, you had way too much data on it. Um, why are you carrying around 10,000 records uh, with PHI on a machine that you you clearly have gone off premise and used elsewhere? These are the things that um, we found raise questions about how are your policies covering them? Because these are just basic hygiene things that you should consider around data retention, data use uh, and ownership. Sometimes we'll find admin accounts that have huge percentage of access. You know, you just have to compromise one admin's uh, account and you can pretty much be guaranteed that you can get a lot of uh, access to PHI or one group has an inordinate amount of access, uh, allowed access to, to content. Those are things that you need to go back to your policies. And they're relatively straightforward for us to, to adjust. Um, but it's the when we find it, what did the policy should what should the policy say? That's really interesting, David. Uh, I'm sorry, was someone going to jump in? Oh, no, I was going to say sometimes. Go ahead, uh, sometimes it's challenging because everything David's saying makes tons of sense and it's very very practical and wise. But we have legal requirements as to data retention, which can maybe it goes back seven years, maybe it goes back ten years, it goes back to you know age of majority for you know, pediatrics <laughs> and things like that. And you don't have to store it necessarily in the same place where it could be an, uh, an open target for somebody, but you do have to store it somewhere. And I think um, that can sometimes be an extra challenge in terms of trying to be wise about right sizing mm. uh, what you're accessing for PHI. You have to sort of you know, measure, measure both and be compliant with both. 
as you mitigate your risk, you have to be compliant with holding on to a whole bunch of data that you may more than likely never look at. No, that makes perfect sense. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, David. I'm sure. I think that's that's always been the gee. If you have a legal hold for some reason, how do we differentiate that from the other PHI that you might have that that's been sitting out there? But what we see is the percentage of data that you have over 10 years old, 20 years old, is just sometimes almost staggering. And you go, you can't possibly be all on legal hold. So I think ultimately this whole game around PHI is going to come back to, do I know the identities of all the content associated uh, all, of all the EPHI so I can start to group them based on the identities of the patients? And then you can associate them somewhere else with, should they be on legal hold? Should they be retained this long? Um, but that's a that's a whole other side of the equation that I think we'll we'll have to get to at some point. But David, your but Tau site will help raise awareness on it, on that, right? You know, the dashboards showing where PHI is to me that kind of raises that awareness to give it that visibility, so we can have those those tough conversations mm -hmm. with legal and privacy. All right, can we start deleting this? You know, those sort of things. Yeah, that whole that whole top ten, top twenty users or you uh, you know people who have excess amount of data or they have data on their laptops, those are all become initial top topics, talking points with right. individuals. I think everything in healthcare ultimately comes back to, can I associate who owns this data, which clinician, and then can I rationalize why that person should have that much data or, or, um, right. or use that data or move that data. So one of the critical things in handling EPHI is understanding the context of who's using it, who owns it, who's touching it, and where is it going? Uh, and then finally, who, whose records are these? David, you, um, so from what you're describing, implementing a tool like TauSite can help on, well, can, can result in uncovering a lot of policy problems, right? So it, it'll surface, it'll bring those to the surface as you're trying to get the tool to work in line with the policies, you say, hey, your policies are messed up. <laughs> like you, you got a lot of problems here. So uh, then then the policies have to be reviewed. Um, ideally, I would imagine you'd like to come into a place that's already done some work to clean up their policies. Do you care? No, well, actually um, they, they're all over the place. Some people have good policies and some people will go, I never knew about these things, so let's let's take let's go back and review our policies. Uh, and sometimes it's the it's the CISOs that tell me I didn't know anything about this, so now we're going to fix it. Uh -huh. and so it 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 goes back to what James said. First visibility, let's address the big items and incrementally get finer and finer grain. Um, but sometimes there's there's some glaring stuff out there. It's it's, it's incredibly been an, it's been an, an eyeful when you find laptops that you thought were encrypted that had PHI that actually roamed out of onto non-corporate networks. You go, this machine's been in other places uh, with a lot of data and it's an un unencrypted. So it's like, I always suspect that's your worst nightmare, James and, and Rich. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's what we work to avoid. Oh, it's right up there. <laughs> that's right up there, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that uh, dovetails in with um, what we're going to talk about here. Uh, and I did hear this uh, during an interview with a CISO who talked about, and this, this has to do with third-party risk, application rationalization, basically knowing where things are. A lot of times, if things are bought outside the proper governance process, it never gets in front of IT, never gets in front of IT security especially with the cloud and someone's credit card and application is purchased and spun up and data gets moved into it. Well, sometimes the CISO, that's when they find out if they've got good visibility into EPHI movements, that may be the trigger that says, hey, something's going on over here to a place you didn't even know we had. Um, right. So is this an interesting sort of benefit to, uh, to e uh, detecting and understanding EPHI movements is you may be alerted to a new application that you were never that you never vetted. Um, James, let's start with you. 
Yeah, totally. And again, to me, this plugs into the overall data loss prevention kind of strategy, right? What are we doing on our endpoints to detect that, to monitor the web activity, the sites that are going to, what sort of data is being uploaded or, or they're trying to upload. And then again, I think Talcite will help, help fill in that picture, right? Add some more, uh, you know, some more light to the gaps that we have today. Rich, um, we're, we're, I mean, this is a big problem. Uh, the sort of third party people buying stuff without approval. I don't know if it's a big issue by you, but I know it's, it's a big issue in a lot of places that shadow IT, dark IT, whatever you want to call it. We, you know, we've, we've done some work to look at uh, potential areas where shadow IT exists. We also, you know, ha our network, we have our, our third party partner who um, you know, runs our um, technical operations center. Um, has, is always reading our, reading our network to find out where assets are and trying to keep an accurate asset inventory of what's out there. Um, that's no guarantee that we're going to find everything, but it helps us. Um, I think really staying close to our users, understanding workflows, just talking to people in terms of what they do day in and day out, sometimes that can surface things that are happening that we didn't know about. Um, but it's an, it's, an, it's an ongoing battle to make sure that we have that. David, are you seeing that, 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 that through using your tool that uh, CIOs and CISOs are finding applications uh, that contain data that they, that maybe were recently purchased, maybe stuff that's been around a long time that they just had no idea about? So we have a dashboard that shows most popular apps, most commonly used apps that touch PHI. But the one I find interesting are the least, the rare apps, the apps that it's not commonly used. The apps that are brand new or have a very short life. So if you believe crowdsource data could be, or the wisdom of the crowd says, gee, if 90% of the users are touching, are using this app, you can probably trust it. If there's only a handful of wacko apps that nobody else uses, but is and is relatively new and is opening PHI, I would basically go, that's where I want to generate the alert. So knowing what apps touch PHI, and knowing its rarity, that's the stuff you want to find. Hey, David, on that point, though, if I can jump in like with a question, is that is that aggregated across all of your customers and or for that specific? Today, today, it's, sing, today it's by single apps, in, but we know the hash codes of all the apps that, that touch PHI. And so one of the things is, hey, as I get more and more data aggregated across multiple organizations, the nice. metadata, which doesn't contain anything about your hospital specific info, we could basically say, gee, you know, this app is starting to show up on multiple places. And it's a, it, it's the classic, my, my worst fear would be an app, a brand new app, very few people use it. It's new and it's touching PHI and it, it's running with some sort of elevated privilege, privileges. And you go, okay. and the, and the final one would be, and the user's credential, the user's not, not on the network logged in. That is your worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. True. That's what, yeah. we, that's actually part of when I started Housesite. I had a conversation with a CIO who got hacked by WannaCry. He, he said, we have no idea how I came in, how we got whacked by this thing. And we didn't have visibility to what was going on across the system. This is in the UK, by the way. So it was not American uh, hospital. And I said, we could do better than that. We, sh you know, we should be able to know what's going on. We should know what's the rarity of an application as opposed to the commonality. I should know that that thing is touching PHI. I should know the thing is opening files up the right and left. Why is it doing that? Those are the kinds of behaviors that we should be looking for specific to the healthcare industry because that's what's going to cause you to have that major leap that you didn't know about. That's what I worry about. Yeah, I agree. There's another thing which has crept up for us. It's a small headache for us right now, but I could see it becoming a very big headache. And that is in the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, we're obligated to work with any number of different third party patient portals that a patient may choose to bring to the table. And, you know, those portals do have to meet minimum security requirements, but um, we don't have, I mean, they're not traditional business associates. We don't really have control of the PHI that goes into those portals. And even though the Cures Act says that we're not going to be, quote unquote, legally liable if any mm -hmm. of those portals have a breach, practically speaking, it doesn't matter. If one of those portals has a breach, 
our PHI is out there and patients aren't going to make the distinction whether we're legally liable or not. We'll have lost that goodwill. We have lost that trust and uh, we're going to have exposure. So sometimes I think uh, all those good intentions about being able to provide empowerment over data can sometimes come back and bite you if you're not careful. So, I mean, I, 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 lo I love the idea and principle of empowering, empowering patients and making their data available to them. But when you're introducing, um, you know, by statute, the possibility of third parties with whom you've got relatively little control over, that's that's a risk. That hasn't been a huge problem for us yet, but I can see it becoming one. Interesting. All right, very good. Let's. Uh, we got a couple of audience questions, so let's uh, let's get to those. All right. Are the supposedly secure applications and platforms that are available for texting, SMS messaging, and emails truly secure? And would you, as a decision maker, look into these, I guess, support the use of these? Rich, I think you touched on that before. Are there tools that you're comfortable with that are okay? Yeah, we, I mean, we, I mean, we do, we do have, um, we do have secure texting tools. And in those secure texting tools, we have uh, urgent notifications. You can text pictures. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. So we're okay with using those. It's just either you can go to a desktop um, website and access the texting there, or you can do it through a through a mobile app. Um, I guess sometimes because everyone is so used to using traditional texting, it's just, oh my goodness, there's one more app I have to go open and put my pin in or use my face ID to get into. So um, we have to really emphasize the fact that, yes, it might be ever so slightly more inconvenient, though I think hardly inconvenient overall, but not quite as straightforward as just popping a text out. you got to do it. And I, I've been comfortable with the fact that uh, those secure, secure texting platforms are secure. I'd always want to do my due diligence because maybe not every single one is, but the one that we're using, I believe, is. Right. James, yeah. any thoughts? Yeah, mirrored, same answer, right? We rolled that out here at Baptist about seven or eight years ago and standardized on a, a Cortex. It was Improvider Cortex. And that, that was a standard and we educated. And uh, yes, so we felt it was secure, the, uh, the authentication, the encryption end to end. So yes. All right, I got one. I think this would be for you, David, it's, uh, if, if you can answer it. <clears throat> Thinking of Epic specifically, would this tool, I assume we're talking about Tau site, track users who use and export data out of Slicer Dicer? Our organization is promoting quote unquote problem solvers and have made Slicer Dicer widely available to provide users data driven tools to help with operational PI. PI but keep uh, but keep me up at night. Yeah. Um, your thoughts, David? Slicer and Dicer is a great tool for extracting data from Epic, and we see it all the time, especially in research facilities where they would export out tons of tabular data to analyze. And one of the things that we actually do spend a lot of time worrying about is how do you deal with these tagged fields in spreadsheets, and and uh, how do you deal with the data that's in them? How do you how do you analyze it? How do you take it apart? How do you figure out the PHI content and then obviously track where it's going and how is it stored? So the answer is yes, slicer and dicer is a is a thing that we we deal with. Okay. Yeah. Hey Anthony, can I add on yes, top sir. of that? Go ahead, Jimmy. I mean, right. To me, the risk there would be, right, that the with the increased access to data is, is the potential then increase to download it, right? So then if people are making local copies. You know, there's risk there or doing something with it or uploading it or keeping their own you know database or whatever and so that's where to me tau site will help <clears throat> help find those local copies help make sure that we're identifying that risk and helping to stay in compliance so we manage risk very good well and this is we touched on this how do you reconcile the need to keep P ephi safe with the potential demand by those that bring in the money to not make their lives more difficult via security restrictions that seem to be a hindrance on patient care. Rich, you just touched on that. You mentioned it's my, uh, slightly more inconvenient. You have to go on another app. I mean, uh, you get everybody gets complaints, right? Everybody who's asking clinicians, especially high powered clinicians that bring in the money to do something outside of the way they would like to do it, there's gonna be some friction there. And I assume it's explaining the reason behind why we're trying to keep this secure, right? I mean, we go to, then we go to, hey, ransomware, you don't have these apps, you try and practice medicine, 
the way you want to practice medicine without the technologies we offer. And there's patient safety, right? That's why we want to tie all this stuff to patient safety in a realistic way, not an over the top excessive way that makes people say, Oh, you're just, yeah. you're just overdoing it. Anyway, your thoughts there. Was that for Rich? Yeah, that was for you. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Anthony. <laughs> <That's> okay. okay. <laughs> oh, it's, I mean, what you described is a very, very, very real dynamic. And I kind of live it in an interesting way in my world because um, as I don't have a CISO, so I'm both the CIO and the security officer. And the CIO part of me is trying to make data as accessible and pervasive and easy to access as possible. And the HIPAA security officer part of me is, uh, yeah, I get all that, but I have to make sure that we have all the necessary protections to make sure that we're you know, keeping our system secure and that we're not letting data leak. And yes, those two are very much in conflict. And um, I, ha I sort of have two different audiences. I need to make sure I'm pleasing when in so doing. So it's like something on your shoulder, right? You're talking to you? <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> James, how, do you, how, do you, how are you managing that dynamic? Yeah, again, I, I agree with Rich, but I would add, um, again, it's going to go back to that common theme you're, you're hearing from me, balancing the risk, informed risk-based decision-making, and then the relationships. And so one way I manage it is, <clears throat> I know we have pain points, right? So I have a weekly touch point with my CMIO, <clears throat> and we just focus on pain points. And what are, like, what is my status of, of IT or my team making improvements on those pain points? And how are we working together? But it's about that you know, giving that, having that voice and that visibility to make sure that we're always trying to balance that because there's no perfect solution. And if we go too far, right, then that's bad. But if we could swing the pendulum the other way, that's bad as well. So it, again, it's about that constant lines of, of open, you know, talk on that and uh, making sure we're balancing. Very good. Uh, David, I'm interested in learning about some of the conversations you have with uh, prospects, um, organizations that have not particularly signed on yet, uh, but maybe you're curious, maybe it's a, an outgoing approach where they haven't come to you, but in a sense, you've gone to them through different channels. What are you hearing about, again, what people are doing today to deal with it? And if somebody is not looking to move forward with a tool like yours, is it a cost issue? Is it a well, we've got to get our policy house in order first. We're not ready to even think of a tool. Uh, what are what are some of the reasons that people might not just jump on right away? So often it is um, priorities and staffing. Uh, less so because our cost is uh, is relatively modest compared to some of the other cobbled together tools that you might need. Uh, the cost has not typically been an issue. We're SaaS, we're easy to deploy. We don't require the, the, the manpower power that you typically would need to, to uh, put together. We built a system so that is really designed for ease of deployment. Um, so the, the answers can come back really quickly. And sometimes what I've heard is um, we're not ready to hear what you might find, or we're mm -hmm. not ready to hear that we might need to do more stuff. So it, it's, it's a reticence on their part to say when we're ready to engage and we're we're through some of our other priorities, um, let's engage then. So it's it's been more of that. What we have found have been people who have awareness of what happens in a breach or post breach um, organizations, they're incredibly aware of what needs to be done. So there's a little bit of the, it's not gonna happen to me attitude that I, I sense, and I don't wanna quite call it the ostrich phenomenon, but it is a little bit of the, it's, it's gonna be somebody else. There are 5,000 hospitals out there, somebody else, the odds are low. And, uh, and so there's a little bit of that that we sense. So when somebody has experienced a breach, they're much more receptive to talking about a tool like this because they know uh, it can happen to them. Absolutely. It's just a, it's either the new team or the team that has been woken up to say, yeah, we're never going to let this happen again. And, and several of, uh, and, we, and we work with several legal firms that do incident remit, uh, response and they basically go, yeah, this is exactly the kind of stuff they should have been doing before they had the breach, both preventatively during the breach 
and then post breach to help us uh, mediate faster. And I think it's it's very telling and and very hysterical that you use the term the new team, because sometimes that's sometimes what happens. <laughs> uh, gee, you know, I'm talking to a new CIO, and you go, well, wait, uh, it goes, yes, we had this. So, right. yes, the new team, the new team. We don't want to <laughs> let's let's fix the problem so we don't become the old team, right? Yeah. That's the messaging out there. Um, very good. All right. We have a couple minutes left and I think we'll get to my favorite part. Ask a co-panelist. And I want to hear Rich, what is your question for your co-panelists? Let me throw this out to James in particular, but it's also something that I'd love to hear what David's got to say of all of the things that people come to you about complaining as it relates to security. Uh, what's the most common theme that people express frustrations about that you're in a position that you might be able to at least somewhat address? That's a okay, great question. Uh, and I would say it's the having to enter their password too many times. Yeah. Some, it, it's a toss up between MFA and, and entering, having to enter a password too many times. For example, and actually, this is actually to tie back to my previous comment. This is high on my list with my CMIO right now. We have, we have a portal in a, you know, where our, our, our doctors log into and they have to log into the portal and also MFA in. Then they have to log into the EMR and MFA into that. And so those are some of the pain points that we're looking to, to really consolidate and, and streamline. Uh, and so really, I think it's along those lines are really the most common themes that we hear that we're working to resolve actively. I can relate to that, thanks. <laughs> David, any thoughts on, on what you hear out there about the complaints around security? Um. I think it's the it's the same questions. Um, are you going to block my users? Are you going to take proactive steps to stop them from doing something? So I have a lot of physicians and and healthcare providers in my family, and that my my brother who's an anesthesiologist always tells me, "Do not ever stop me from doing something." Mm. It's like okay, <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. So I mean, that's so telling, right? I mean. You get in the way of that, you're going to get someone banging on your door in the old days. Now you'll get, I don't know, some kind I of threat. Know. I don't know what text the new message or, yeah. How do you, what's the equivalent in our, in our world of banging on your door, Rich? What is that? <laughs> oh, maybe a all caps in the subject line of an email. Is that what it oh, would be? And in 2023, they still bang on my door. <laughs> <laughs> or texting. They have other angles. Yep. The all caps it's text or whatever it may be, but uh, they bang on my door. They'll get you. They'll get you. All right, real quick, James, a question for your co-panelists. Mm, any, many, many, mo. All right, David, when are you going to support 365? Ah, and if so, great. what is your your thoughts and timeline around 365 down the road? 360, oh, 365 is a great issue that now we now that everybody's moved all their email into the O365. Oh, and James, mm -hmm. thank you for for alerting us to this issue, which is clinicians have tons of data in their O365 accounts, just like I have tons of stuff in my G Suite account. It's my work history. It's everything I've mm -hmm. done in my entire work career. And boy, I will hold on to it as long as I can, but it's also my li biggest liability. If my credentials were ever hacked and fished, my entire everything would be exposed. So James has this um, need for us to examine Office O365 content, and we are proactively working on that right now um, to use the API that Microsoft has provided to couple that with our AI classification engine to give you a full inventory. We are very close to being able to show you that working uh, with a with a productized version probably later this year. Awesome, I'm excited about that, thank you. All right, well, we'll have to get you back here to talk about it. Uh, very, very good. That is about all we had time for today. Uh, regarding continuing education, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready for viewing. If you wanna sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and go to our website to register for upcoming panels. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel, James Case, Rich Temple, and David Ting. I want to thank TauSite for sponsoring and making the event possible, and you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Thank you, everybody.